Assalamu alaikum everybody. My name is Dina Kishawi. I am a Chicago born and raised Palestinian. Both of my parents were born in Gaza City before they came to Chicago. And for the last 15 years, my family has been deeply involved in the American Muslims for Palestine. And I mention that because, especially over the last few years, the narrative around Palestine has completely shifted. A topic of conversation we couldn't speak about when I was growing up and in elementary school has, because, has become something that in the last few years is openly discussed in public forums, in school, in the workplace, professionally and personally, Palestine has become a forefront of the conversation. That being said, I'd like to introduce today's session, which is Palestine in the US. What's with the new dynamics? How come this conversation and this topic that was once so ostracized and politicized is now very openly spoken about? So I'll introduce all of our speakers at once, and then before they come up, I'll give them their full bio. But we have with us Ahmed Abu Zned, Linda Sarsour, Dr. Osama Abu Rashid, and Ms. Anurada Mattel. First up, I'd like to introduce Ahmed Abu Zned, who is the executive director of the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. He went to law school and is now the co-founder of the Florida-based Dream Defenders in response to the killing of Trayvon Martin. He also champions racial justice issues around the United States and has served on multiple organizations for the movement for black lives and other social justice issues to fight for rights in Palestine. Please honor Ahmed Abu Zned and let us join him with us. All right, thank you so much. Salam alaikum, everyone. So I was really excited for this conversation, uh, not just because of the subject matter and how it should inspire us to be hopeful and to keep pushing, but also because of the wonderful people. And I'm sorry my back is turned to you. Super awkward, you know, having such wonderful people behind you as you speak, but we'll do our best with it. So I'll list some of the things I think have changed. But first and foremost, we have to talk about what has not changed. And that is the sumud and steadfastness of the Palestinian people. Mashallah, 70 plus years. They said the old would die and the young would forget. And that quote is as silly as Zionism itself. So we're a product of generations of passing down both the pain, but also the passion of our homeland. Our parents instilled this in us the way they instilled adab. And our deen, back home in Palestine, but also generations here in the US have contributed to this evolution. And I wanted to highlight a couple of Palestinians that are gonna make this case. In the last session, I mentioned a brother named Basim Masri, Allah irhamo, a dear brother to many of us in the movement who gave his life to the movement in Ferguson. And we miss him dearly. But Linda and I had a chance to travel to Ferguson during the uprising and build with Bassem and his family. And I want to talk about the moment that we actually, you know, speaking of what our parents instilled in us, we met with Zuhdi Masri, which was Bassem Masri's father. Zuhdi Masri is a store owner in northern St. Louis, in the hood. And, and one of the most amazing things, I mean, Palestinians can really do anything. This brother who had left occupation and apartheid and colonization, ended up in northern St. Louis, opening up a business, helped to shepherd peace between two rival gangs in St. Louis, right? I mean, so we're, we're actually making peace between gangs in St. Louis. That was Zuhdi Masri. And while we were sitting there talking to Zuhdi, my mind was blown. Customer after customer walking in and saying, hey, uncle, hey, dad. These were members of the community in St. Louis. And they referred to him as such because of how he treated them, because of the environment his store created, because of the familiar approach that he and his family had. And of course, Bassem took that to the next level, being on the front lines in Ferguson, day after day, night after night. And we want to keep his memory uplifted. I'm also going to mention my dear sister, Linda Sarsour, here. And without stealing much of her thunder, 
She led one of the largest protests in the history of the United States of America, the Women's March. Give it up, please. I'm sure the Zionist organizations and institutions would have loved to see such a formation without the existence of a Palestinian woman, without the core team being rep represented so strongly by a fierce Palestinian sister, but this is who we are. And they messed with the wrong people. And so whether in Palestine, in 48, in the occupied territories, in the refugee camps, or here in the US, we know we will continue to resist. We know we will continue to organize until one day we all go home. You all heard earlier from Huayda Arraf, who's hopefully going to be going to Congress and representing our dreams and visions in the halls of Congress. Huayda and the ISM is something we should all be proud of. When the Gaza flotilla was breaking through international waters into Gaza, we felt an immense moment of pride, and that was Huayda and her co-founders, Huayda and her co-organizers. You know, over this last year, we all became enamored and in love and in direct relationship with Muhammad and Muna al-Kurd, and I saw that Muna had a chance to speak to you all earlier. How about that couple? How about that brother and sister? Palestinians, no matter where we, go, where we go, where we end up, we're going to rise up. And I'm incredibly proud to be a part of this legacy of peoples. But it's not just the individuals, it's institutions like AMP. So shout out to AMP, give yourselves a round of applause. Every single one of you today has been giving your heart and soul, your time, your efforts, your donations to this collective vision of liberation and so it's not just the individuals, it's our institutions, it's our organizations, it's our communities bringing us together. So USPCN, USCPR, Adala Justice Project, so on and so forth. We uplift you, we appreciate you. Fragmented and fractured, but never leaving our homeland behind, the young will never forget because their dream is Palestine. Another huge difference and distinction over the last few years has been social media. We used to dream of the day that CNN would highlight the atrocities that our people undergo every day. But these days we no longer need CNN. Mark Lamont Hill was fired by CNN and he started up the BNC, the Black News Channel. We don't need these mainstream media outlets anymore. Pictures and videos now reaching hundreds of millions of people when we used to hope they would reach thousands. This has allowed for solidarity to blow through borders, boundaries, languages, and religions, through races, through ethnicities, all understanding how deeply important Palestinian liberation is to their own liberation. But my people seeing the truth and even acknowledging the truth is not enough. Recently, we saw an example of Ahmaud Arbery. We all witnessed that video months ago. We saw as clear as day that was murder. And yet many of us were unsure, would the courts see what we saw? Would the courts be able to act upon what we saw? And so here, when we think about members of Congress, they know the truth. They know what's happening to our people. It's not enough to show them the videos and the pictures. We have to push them. We have to push them until they can't do anything other than stand up for the Palestinian cause. My time is running short and I wanna hear from these amazing people and hopefully we can get into a conversation. But dear family members, we have to be relentless in our pursuit of justice. We must leave no stone unturned. Advocacy, lobbying, education, arts, culture, organizing, and love. We must utilize every tool in our tool set to get to liberation, and one day we will. Thank you for being here today. We'll see each other in a free Jerusalem, inshallah. Thank you, Ahmed. Next up, I'd like to introduce Anurada Mattel. She's the founder and executive director of the Oakland Institute, which is an internationally renowned organization, and she is an expert on both developmental, human rights, and agricultural issues. 
She has received the title of Most Valuable Thinker by The Nation magazine. Under her leadership, the Institute has unveiled the impacts of land grabbing in the developing world, revealing a disturbing pattern and a lack of transparency, fairness, and accountability. Now, one more thing I'd like to add is, as we're talking about the changing dynamics, we often talk about how in the last 10, last 15 years, majority of the organizations that were talking about Palestine and the cause were predominantly Palestinian organizations. So this is a pretty significant shift that we have organizations and other institutes that are joining us, previously like with MLFA, who are taking part in this initiative for liberation and justice for Palestine. So please join me in welcoming Anurada Mattel. Salam alaikum. Very honored to be here. As I walked into the hotel, I found my eyes staring up. I'm just deeply humbled to be also in the company of these incredible brothers and sisters. My name is Anuradha Mittal. I'm here from the Oakland Institute where I work on land rights. Some might say I'm a human rights activist who works on human rights issues around the globe from my country, India, to Sri Lanka, to Tanzania, to Kenya, to Palestine. I'm very aware that for many in this room, it is virtually impossible to return or travel to your motherland, as Ahmed once gently pointed out to me. I've had the privilege of traveling to West Bank several times and witnessed firsthand the everyday struggles and dispossession of Palestinian communities under the Israeli occupation. Privilege brings responsibility, and this is why I am here. A resident of the village of Nabi Saleh, Basem Tamimi, once said to me, you cannot be free without my freedom. This is not about solidarity. It is your responsibility and your duty to join my struggle. This is why I, as an Aradha, or the executive director of the Oakland Institute, am here at the American Muslims for Palestine. Palestine is in the US. Yes, it is in the US because the ugly reality of the two separate racist legal systems that govern West Bank cannot be hidden any longer. With the Israeli settlers subject to Israeli civilian and criminal legal system and the Palestinians under the Israeli military law, which includes Palestinian children. Palestine is in the United States because every year Israel prosecutes between 500 and 700 Palestinian children in military courts. No Israeli child comes into contact with military court system. I had traveled to Nabi Saleh to learn about the weekly nonviolent uh, marches that are organized by the villagers since 2009 to protest the occupation. My journey from Janine to Nabi Saleh was made longer by the blockades. The signs of the village were missing, missing letters on the hard to find sign for the village, which is otherwise internationally renowned for its resistance was an attempt to obliterate another Palestinian village, its Palestinian residents, and the Palestinian identity itself. Homes were fenced with garlands of used gas canisters, a familiar feature of daily life under occupation. Yes, Palestine is in the US because this ugly reality cannot be hidden by Israeli government any longer. The nearby settlement Halamalish was established in 1976 on lands belonging to the village of Nabi Saleh. Halamish continued to expand with the fence built in 2008, preventing villagers' access to their own land. And an Israeli court ruled to dismantle the fence. However, Halamish settlers illegally annexed more land and took uh, over Nabi Saleh's natural spring. As I sat in the courtyard of a Palestinian home, I learned it was in Area C. It was built with permission in 1964 but demolition orders were hanging over the heads of the family since 2010. The order being the price paid by the Palestinian family for resisting occupation. When I traveled, I learned that a quarter of the nearly 775,000 registered refugees in the West Bank live in 19 refugee camps. I visited the Ida refugee camp established in 1950. UNRWA leased the land from the government of Jordan for displaced villages from 27 villages in Western Jerusalem and Western Hebron in 1948. Now, despite the fact that many of the homes that the people were displaced from 
a merely few kilometers away, it is illegal and virtually impossible for the residents of Ida camp to even visit their villages. The entrance of the camp is marked by the long key of return. The symbol of Palestinian refugees' right of return, as guaranteed by the UN Resolution 194, passed by the UN General Assembly in December 48 and endorsed by both the United Kingdom and the United States. 71 years after the camp was established, the refugees still await their right of return to be honored. This is why Palestine is in the United States. Today, Palestine is in the United States. It's in the Congress. It is in the Congress because thousands of people have written letters and called, including myself, asking for our tax dollars not to be fueling this apartheid state and its occupation of Palestine. Today, Palestine is in our hearts and minds. It is in the corporate boardrooms where corporations that have called for dismantling of white supremacy are being held accountable. Today, Palestine is in our hearts and minds because Israel realizes that the dirty secret is out. It is the policies of the Israeli government that have created an apartheid state that is responsible for people joining the struggle for Palestinian liberation. Israel continues to attack leading human rights organizations in Palestine. It is threatening human rights defenders because it knows that the small man builds cages for everyone he knows, while the sage who has to duck her head when the moon is low keeps dropping keys. This is the sage, keep dropping keys all night long for the beautiful rowdy prisoners. I, <laughs> and I'll tell you why Palestine is in corporate boardrooms like Ben and Jerry's. I'll tell you why Palestine is in the minds of those who are in the Congress. I share this little poem that I heard from a small boy at the Ida refugee camp. I will become a kite and fly over the wall, said the boy. If you become a kite and fly over the wall, said his mother, then I will become a clever little child, the best in the neighborhood at kite flying. And I will tie ribbons to you and fly you high above the wall all the way to Jerusalem. Or maybe I'll become a mountain so that I can be bigger than the wall and see over it, said the boy. If you become the mountain and become bigger than the wall, said his mother, I will become a farmer and plant olive trees and tend to you and live from the olives you bear. Palestine is in our minds and hearts because of each one of you. The resistance which cannot be killed, which cannot be suppressed. This is a liberation struggle. And you look at the history. When people unite for liberation, including my own country, India, people are never defeated. It is the immorality and the unethical occupation that comes to an end. And this is why Palestine is in our minds and hearts. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Mattel. We appreciate having you. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Usama Abursheed, who is the executive director and a board member of AMP and the executive director for Americans for Justice in Palestine, AJP. He's also a board member of the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, which is an umbrella organization of eight major national American Muslim organizations. He has studied and has published dozens of things and articles on Middle East and its political climate. So please welcome me in joining Dr. Usama Abershid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I want to go back to the theme of this uh, session. Palestine, what is behind the new dynamics? And there is a reason why we wanted to discuss the new dynamics in the United States, the new shifts. I think every one of us can relate to what happened back in May and in June, when we've seen more support for the Palestinian cause. When we witnessed more members of Congress are willing to stand on principle and speak for Palestine. 
when the media or some of this media, the so-called mainstream media, had to depart partially from its complicity and complacency with the Israeli apartheid. Many were asking this question, why are we seeing this? What is happening? What is going on? And I will give you an answer that was provided to us by a report in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz in 2017. So I'm talking about 2017 now. This report summarized a study by Gallup that was conducted at the end of the year 2016 about the shifts in the public American public opinion in relation to Palestine. So I want to, I want you to listen to how Haaretz summarized the findings of the Gallup study in 2016 and the report was in 2017. The summary was as follows. The more American learn about Israel, the less they like it. That is word to word. What is funny about this is when I said this before, I was accused by some Israeli Zionist outlets here in the U.S. of being anti-Semitic just by using the exact words that I have just read before you, although they were published in the Israeli hearts by an Israeli reporter. The more Americans learn about Israel, the less they like it. Why? It is no longer in use now in the U.S. to see more support, more shifts in favor of Palestine. We see change taking place unfolding before our own eyes in real time. It is no longer a political suicide to speak for Palestine. Ask Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Ask Ilhan Omar. Ask Rashid Atleep. Ask people who are running now for Congress or for office without shying away from stating where they stand on Palestine. Ask Huwaida Arraf if she is here. Is Huwaida here? Is Huwaida Arraf here? I want you to stand up if you're here. Okay, so she's not here. She's running in Michigan now. And she's being attacked, maligned by Fox News because of where she stands on Palestine. But she did not back down. She's not shying away. More and more politicians are running while they're standing in, on principle when it comes to Palestine. Why? Let's go back to the findings of the study of 2017 or the 2016. It pulled more Americans from all backgrounds, including Jewish Americans. And I don't, we don't have time to go through the statistics. But the more they knew about Israel, the more people knew they, they, their love for Israel or their passion for Israel diminished. Palestine is being mainstreamed now in America. I'm not saying that we've reached the finish line. But things are changing. Why? This is one due to the steadfastness, resilience, sacrifices of the Palestinian people on the ground. So let us not compete with them when it comes to credit. Because it is their steadfastness, it is their resilience that is forcing their cause and their plight on all international agendas and platforms. The other reason is, is because of our collective work. Because of our awareing, awareness awareness campaigns. It is because of our organization, not AMP, our organizing on the ground. It is because of the mobilization. It is because we are taking the lead now in America. It is because there is a new generation. Those who are millennials, those who are born between 1984 and 1997, they're more sympathetic to Palestine according to these studies. 
Those who were born after 1997 to 2012, the Gen Z, are more sympathetic to Palestine. These are number statistic, statistics that are confirmed, that are authentic. All what we need is to know these facts. So yes, the more Americans know or learn about Israel, the less they like it, but the more we know the dynamics and the shifts that are taking place, the more we'll be hopeful and enthusiastic. Yesterday, one of our brothers here was joking with another brother who's part of the program, and he said, MashaAllah, very good, nice, nice uh, convention. But are there any heavyweight speakers? And the ones who were speaking are our Gen Z's. <laughs> you know, our uh, 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 Zarifa from AMP, our social media director, uh, Malak from AMP, and Anas from Turkey, who are engaged on Palestine, very young, engaged on Palestine, those who are leading the change on the ground. And I, so I said to that brother, I said, yeah, you're looking at them. Those are the heavyweights. Those are the ones who are causing this change that we are seeing today in America and across the globe. As my brother Ahmed just mentioned, you know, our, this generation is not a hostage of the so-called mainstream media and its complacency and complicity. They see the news in real time. That's why Gantz, the Israeli war minister, they call him the defense minister, took the time during the attack on Gaza back in May to meet with the executives from Facebook and Instagram and the Twitter to speak about restricting the Palestinian content. And they are. But they're failing. You know why they're failing? With all of their hostility against the Palestinian content, they're failing because the Palestinian solidarity movement worldwide, it is, it is more intersectional and it is very broad and open, including Jewish Americans, including Jews who, who, who are proudly Jewish and stand for justice. So they cannot restrict our voices and they cannot restrict what we do. Today, no one in the United States can say with a straight face that Israel transcends political party affiliation. Israel is becoming a partisan issue. It is. When Ocasio, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez stands in Congress, Responding to Biden when he said Israel has the right to defend itself and she responds to him by saying, do the Palestinians have the right to live? This tells you about the shift that is taking place in America. When the former Israeli Prime Minister Don Dreamer says, and I'm going to read to you what he says, Israel should not spend more of its energy preaching or reaching out to passionate Amer uh, or Israel actually should spend more of its energy reaching out to passionate American evangelicals, not Jews who are disproportionately among our critics. When Israel loses the, the, the Jewish youth in this country, this tells you something. It is no longer the Jewish David against the Palestinian Goliath. Today there is Israel's the Israeli Goliath against the Palestinian David. Things are changing, but I will conclude with the following. Look, we could talk about all of these good factors. We could talk about all of the promise and the potential we have. But if we do not pre invest in our potential, if we don't understand our potential, if we don't believe in, our, in, the vo in the power of our voices, in the power of our work, we will go back to point zero. The other side is noticing and they're doubling and tripling their efforts. While we, some of us still questioning, are we seeing a real change or this is a temporary change? Things will change and go back to where they were. They will go back to where they were if we don't do our part. For those who continue to forecast failure, I promise you, that's what you're going to get. You will harvest failure. But if you believe that there is a way forward, and there is a way forward, I promise you things will change. 
with people like Anarada, with people like Linda, with people like Ahmed, and they're all my brothers and sisters, and Dina, and everyone. And with every one of us coming together, working for Palestine, with organizations like the US campaign and the AMP and others, I promise you that in a matter of a few years, you will see a substantive change if we continue this trajectory. I want you to believe in this because my work means nothing equals zero if you don't believe in this. I just came back from Jordan and I will conclude with this. Sorry, uh, Dina, Dina, this is the last thing I'll say, I promise. Wallahi, I get invited to so many webinars in Gaza. Of course, I'm, I can't go to Gaza. Wallah, I get invited to so many webinars in Gaza. Wallah, what they're asking about is to try, trying to understand the, the change and the shifts that are taking place in America. Imagine your brothers and sisters in Gaza, in the West Bank, those who are under oppression are looking up to us. We should not fail them. We should meet their expectations. We should build on their resilience and we should be and we should make them as proud as they are making us proud. And yes, we can do it, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Osama. Now, before I introduce Linda, I want to have two quick announcements. First of all, we'll be having a Q&A just a short question and answer after Linda speaks. And second of all, if you're interested in learning more about what the next generation is doing for Palestine, ways that you can get involved, ways that your children can get involved, the last session tomorrow before our entertainment is exactly about that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Linda Sarsour. Assalamu alaikum. Come on, Chicago, I'm from Brooklyn. Salamu alaikum. That's better. Um, just one correction, Dr. Abu Rashid. Millennials start in 1980. I'm a millennial. Who's born in 1980 and after we're millennials too? We'll make it 81. 80, 80, I never 80. I gotta be 80. I'm from X generation, and I don't like to be an X. Okay, okay, okay. I am so deeply honored and humbled to be here with all of you today. This is my first in-person Muslim convention and I just love being and being able to say hello to people and hug people and be together and I hope that we get to do this again in a few weeks at Mass Ikna. Who's coming to Mass Ikna? All right, that's good too. You all know me very well. I am a proud daughter of Palestine, Bintil Bire. How many better we are in here? I mean, we all have village pride, people. We're a lot, we understand. But I like to make sure I know where my better we are at everywhere I go. I am so proud to be here to support American Muslims for Palestine and this beautiful Palestine convention, the largest convention for Palestinians in the country. And if you're asking me why we've gotten to where we've gotten to today, I will absolutely attribute that to much of the work that AMP and the leaders of AMP have done in the last few years. Sisters and brothers, we are in unprecedented times. We have a lot of pessimists in our community. People who tell you nothing changed, nothing happened, this is all talk, uh, don't waste your time. We have a lot of that in the Muslim community. And I don't talk, I don't organize with pessimists in the Muslim community. Sisters and brothers, we have to learn to celebrate our accomplishments. And we have had many accomplishments. Oftentimes, we are giving our accomplishments away to other people and not attributing to where we got today from our Palestinian grandfathers who came to America and instilled in us the love of Palestine. The reason why your children know Palestine is because the work that you have done in your homes to teach your children about Palestine. Saving your money and sending your children to Palestine in the summer times to spend time with their grandparents, with their cousins to learn Arabic, it is also because of you and the work that you have done. Sisters and brothers, you don't have to be an activist or an organizer or a leader of a Palestinian organization to attribute the success that we have had as a community also to the work that you have done. 
Sisters and brothers, we are starting to hear Israel described as an apartheid state more than we have ever heard that before. When we talk about AOC and Cori Bush and Rashid and Ilhan, these people are not magic. They don't just grow out of the ground and all of a sudden, surprise, we have members of Congress who are good on Palestine. They are good on Palestine because of the work that we have done in our communities, because the power that we have built, because of the numbers of registered voters, we have built political influence in cities across America, and no longer will you run for Congress and not hold a position on the most important global social justice issue of our time, and that is Palestine. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, we are hearing of congregations across the world who are divesting from Palestine, uh, excuse me, from Israel, academic institutions who are also engaging in divestment. We are watching media outlets, including outlets like CNN, who are forced into centering Palestinian voices. You know why? Because as someone said before, I don't need CNN. I have a social media platform. I will say what I want, when I want, anytime that I want. And when they see people with platforms and other people are following our platforms like they are Muhammad al-Kurd and Mun al-Kurd, they are forced to put Muhammad on national television to tell the Palestinian story. We are watching celebrities across the world who are standing with the Palestinian people, including women who are in pageants, who are Miss Greece and Miss Morocco and I don't know who, who are saying that they will not go to the Miss Universe pageant because it's being held in the state of Israel. Sisters and brothers, we've had a lot of evolution on Palestine. And I also attribute that to the young people. The young people on college campuses across America and in particular to Students for Justice in Palestine. I salute you and the courage in the face of opposition every day on your college campuses that you still are steadfast standing up strong for your beloved Palestinian people. Sisters and brothers, this work is hard. Fighting for Palestine is not easy and it comes with consequences. Trust me, if it was easy, everybody would be fighting for Palestine and Palestine might even be free by now. But this work is difficult and it also comes with consequences. And many people in our communities will tell you consequences. People have been fired from jobs. People have been uh, refused tenureships as professors. Some people haven't gotten scholarships because of their stance on Palestine. People have lost financial opportunities because of their stance on Palestine. And I tell every single one of those people, and I tell you all, it is worth it. Nothing that you will endure, no intimidation that you will endure, no financial loss that you will endure will be anything compared to Palestinians living under military occupation or living under siege in Gaza. Sisters and brothers, I always wonder when we talk about Palestine in the Muslim community, right? We, or even in the Palestinian community. We expect our country to be good on this issue. You know, we live in America. Sisters and brothers, you live in a country where people are fighting for health care. You live in a country where people are still fighting for voting rights. You live in a country who stood with South Africa in the time of apartheid. You literally live in a country that is always, almost always, on the wrong side of history. Whether you look in South America or in Central America, why do we think that this country is going to be magically good on an issue like Palestine? Anytime this country has ever done anything right, it is because the people rise up. It's because the people organize. It's because the people put pressure on this U.S. government to do the right thing. Politics in America is never about morality. It's never about the right thing. In this country, we practice the politics of consequences. If I am a member of Congress and I'm going to do a vote uh, on the House floor, the question I ask myself is what consequences will I get if I make this vote? You, my Palestinian community, my Muslim community, have to become the consequences for these members of Congress. Those members of Congress, when they vo vote against the Palestinian people, have to think to themselves, damn, Next time I may not be reelected. I may not raise enough money. I may not have a job in Congress. This is how politics works in America. Politics is dirty in this country. Politics is corrupt in this country. So for us to believe that anybody who goes to Congress 
is really going to go and work in some moral space, one that is centered on human rights, is ridiculous. Because this country has never operated a government by centering human rights. So what I ask all of you to do, sisters and brothers, is to celebrate where we are today, to celebrate our wins today, to think about the Cory Bushes of the world in politics and pray for 10 more Cory Bushes and 20 more Rashides, and to continue to support people politically. Oftentimes in the Muslim community, you'll go to a fundraiser and they'll raise $3 million for Yemen or $3 million for Syria, and I want you to do that. I believe in humanitarian work. I support humanitarian organizations. But we have enough money in our Palestinian American communities that we need to take those same millions of dollars and we need to put it into politics in America because in this country, it's about money and it's about votes. They know no other language. So this do the right thing and justice for Palestine, that works in the streets, it doesn't work in the suites, and it does not work in Congress. Sometimes we're going to be disappointed. And here's what the Palestinian American and Muslim American community does sometimes. Sometimes a member of Congress that you may have liked a little bit does something that you don't agree with. And so what do you do? Nihrad. Wallah, <laughs> I'm not going to support them again. I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to do that again. This is not what the Palestinian people in Palestine teach us. You don't give up. You stay consistent. You educate. You call these members of Congress in. You don't walk away. Because what happens when you walk away and those people still get reelected, you know what they think to themselves? I guess I don't need these people. It looks like I can win without them. So what I am asking you all today that we can be principled and we can wholeheartedly stand with our Palestinian sisters and brothers in Palestine. And we will never give up our own principles. But I ask you also to be strategic politically. And this is why it is important, the work that AMP does and their action fund does, to engage members of Congress politically to stand with the Palestinian people. Sisters and brothers, I have been the target of right-wing Zionists for a long time, and especially in these last five years when they saw me leading the Women's March on Washington. They couldn't believe that a Palestinian woman in a hijab could stand on the highest stages in this land and deem myself to be unapologetically Palestinian-American. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I have had Israeli spy firms hired by Sheldon Adelson to investigate me and my family. I have had opportunities taken from me. In fact, many of you know, I wrote a book last year and they tried to take my book from me. One of the things I told my editors and my publisher is that I'm going to write this book, but before I sign any contracts, I'm gonna talk about my Palestinian heritage and I'm gonna talk about Nekbe, and I'm going to talk about the history of my people. And the, the, the agreement that we have is that will not be edited out of my book. And I also told them that in every library in America, in every bookstore in America, there will be a Palestinian woman in a hijab on the front page of a book. And so I want you, sisters and brothers, to believe that your story is important, to tell your story, to not be in despair when you lose an opportunity or something that you believe that you deserve. Sisters and brothers, it is worth it. You know why? Because you know what is bigger than right-wing Zionists? God is bigger. So every time they've taken something from me, sisters and brothers, Allah blessed me 20 times more. Because we are a people of faith. We have something much bigger. Sisters and brothers, I will end by telling you all, and I believe this from the deepest of my heart, that we are our great, great, great grandmother's wildest dreams manifested. Our ancestors dreamed that one day we would go to the Ghurba and we will build political power and we will educate ourselves and we will build wealth and we will build generations of Palestinian children who still call for Palestine. 
And one day, because of our collective efforts, we will push this nation to be on the right side of history and to alleviate harm and suffering against our people. And in this lifetime, because of you and because of me and because of the American Muslims for Palestine and because of all those who made this convention possible, including Salah Sarsour, who is the chairman and should get the credit for all the work that he does, a quiet storm in the background that one day we will be together with our children and our grandchildren in a free Palestine. Salaamu Alaikum. <laughs>